Welcome to Aristotle Walks, where amazing philosophy papers are read aloud. I aim to build a resource for seekers of philosophy, for those who prefer to learn by listening rather than reading, and specifically for those with vision impairments. Today I will be reading Donald Davidson's seminal paper, Actions, Reasons, and Causes, from 1963 in the Journal of Philosophy. The structure of this video is as follows. First, the paper, then a bit on Donald Davidson, who I think is amazing. Finally, a brief recap of his paper and mention of the parts of Aristotle's work which clearly influenced Davidson in this famous paper. Without further ado, his abstract. What is the relation between a reason and an action? When the reason explains the action by giving the agents reason for doing what they did. We may call such explanations rationalizations and say that the reason rationalizes the action. In this paper, I want to defend the ancient and common sense position that rationalization is a species of ordinary causal explanation. The defense no doubt requires some redeployment, but not more or less complete abandonment of the position, as urged by many recent writers. Now, I recognize that his abstract sounds very convoluted, but the paper itself is much more straightforward. You might also be thinking, who is Davidson referring to when he says recent writers? Given that he wrote in the paper in 1963 and he died in 2003. In a footnote, he mentions several people. I'll mention just a few. Anscombe, Stuart Hampshire, H.L.A. Hart, and Anthony Kenny. And before we get to section one, I don't know how familiar you are with philosophy papers, but often in philosophy papers, the author defines a term at the beginning, so they can use it that way for the rest of their paper. When Davidson here says, we may call such explanations rationalizations, that's what's happening. Section 1. A reason rationalizes an action only if it leads us to see something the agent saw, or thought they saw, in their action. Some feature, consequence, or aspect of the action the agent wanted, desired, prized, held dear, thought dutiful, beneficial, obligatory, or agreeable. We cannot explain why someone did what they did simply by saying the particular action appealed to them. We must indicate what it was about the action that appealed. Whenever someone does something for a reason, therefore, they can be characterized as a having some sort of pro-attitude toward actions of a certain kind, and b believing or knowing, perceiving, noticing, remembering, that their action is of that kind. Under A are to be included desires, wantings, urges, promptings, and a great variety of moral views, aesthetic principles, economic prejudices, social conventions, and public and private goals and values, insofar as these can be interpreted as attitudes of an agent directed toward actions of a certain kind. The word Attitude does yeoman service here, for it must cover not only permanent character traits that show themselves in a lifetime of behavior, like love of children or a taste for loud company, but also the most passing fancy that prompts a unique action, like a sudden desire to touch a woman's elbow. In general, pro-attitudes must not be taken for convictions, however temporary, that every action of a certain kind ought to be performed, is worth performing, or is, all things considered, desirable. On the contrary, a person may, all their life, have a yense to drink a can of paint, without ever, even at the moment they yield, believing it would be worth doing. Giving the reason why an agent did something is often a matter of naming the pro-attitude A or the related belief B, or both. Let me call this pair the primary reason why the agent performed the action. Now it is possible to reformulate the claim that rationalizations are causal explanations, and give structure to the argument as well, by stating two theses about primary reasons. 
One, for us to understand how a reason of any kind rationalizes an action, it is necessary and sufficient that we see, at least in essential outline, how to construct a primary reason. Two, the primary reason for an action is its cause. I shall argue for these points in turn. As you likely know, the field of philosophy has many subfields. Section 2 opens with what becomes a famous example in theory of action. Let's get started. Section 2. I flip the switch, turn on the light, and illuminate the room. Unbeknownst to me, I also alert a prowler to the fact that I am home. Here I do not do four things, but only one, of which four descriptions have been given. I flipped the switch because I wanted to turn on the light, and by saying I wanted to turn on the light, I explain, i.e. give my reason for, rationalize, the flipping. But I do not, by giving this reason, rationalize my alerting of the prowler, nor my illuminating of the room. Since reasons may rationalize what someone does when it is described in one way, and not when it is described in another, we cannot treat what was done simply as a term in sentences like, My reason for flipping the switch was that I wanted to turn on the light. Otherwise, we would be forced to conclude, from the fact that flipping the switch was identical with alerting the prowler, that my reason for alerting the prowler was that I wanted to turn on the light. Let us mark this quasi-intentional character of action descriptions in rationalizations by stating a bit more precisely a necessary condition for primary reasons. Condition 1. R is a primary reason why an agent performed the action A under the description D only if R consists of a pro-attitude of the agent toward actions with a certain property and a belief of the agent that A under the description D has that property. How can my wanting to turn on the light be part of a primary reason, since it appears to lack the required element of generality? We may be taken in by the verbal parallel between I turned on the light and I wanted to turn on the light. The first clearly refers to a particular event, so we conclude that the second has the same event as its object. Of course, it is obvious that the event of my turning on the light can't be referred to in the same way by both sentences, since the existence of the event is required by the truth of I turned on the light, but not by the truth of I wanted to turn on the light. If the reference were the same in both cases, the second sentence would entail the first. But in fact, the sentences are logically independent. What is less obvious, at least until we attend to it, is that the event whose occurrence makes I turned on the light true cannot be called the object, however intentional, of I wanted to turn on the light. If I turned on the light, then I must have done it at a precise moment in a particular way, every detail is fixed. But it makes no sense to demand that my want be directed at an action performed at any one moment or done in some unique manner. Any one of an indefinitely large number of actions would satisfy the want and can be considered equally eligible as its object. Wants and desires often are trained on physical objects. However, I want the gold watch in the window is not a primary reason and explains why I went into the store only because it suggests a primary reason. For example, that I wanted to buy the watch. Because I wanted to turn on the light and I turned on the light are logically independent, the first can be used to give a reason why the second is true. Such a reason gives minimal information it implies that the action was intentional, and wanting tends to exclude some other pro-attitudes, such as a sense of duty or obligation. 
But the exclusion depends very much on the action and the context of explanation. Wanting seems pallid beside lusting, but it would be odd to deny that someone who lusted after a woman or a cup of coffee wanted her or it. It is not unnatural, in fact, to treat wanting as a genus including all pro-attitudes as species. When we do this and when we know some action is intentional, it is empty to add that the agent wanted to do it. In such cases, it is easy to answer the question, why did you do it, with, for no reason, meaning not that there is no reason, but that there is no further reason, no reason that cannot be inferred from the fact that the action was done intentionally, no reason, in other words, besides wanting to do it. This last point is not essential to the present argument, but it is of interest because it defends the possibility of defining an intentional action as one done for a reason. A primary reason consists of a belief and an attitude, but it is generally odious to mention both. If you tell me you are easing the jib because you think that will stop the mane from backing, I don't need to be told that you want to stop the mane from backing. And if you say you are biting your thumb at me because you want to insult me, there is no point in adding that you think that by biting your thumb at me you will insult me. Similarly, many explanations of actions in terms of reasons that are not primary do not require mention of the primary reason to complete the story. If I say I am pulling weeds because I want a beautiful lawn, it would be fatuous to eke out the account with and so I see something desirable in any action that does or has a good chance of making the lawn beautiful. Why insist that there is any step, logical or psychological, in the transfer of desire from an end that is not an action to the actions one conceives as means? It serves the argument as well that the desired end explains the action only if what are believed by the agent to be means are desired. Fortunately, it is not necessary to classify and analyze the many varieties of emotions, sentiments, moods, motives, passions, and hungers whose mention may answer the question, why did you do it, in order to see how, when such mention rationalizes the action, a primary reason is involved. Claustrophobia gives a person's reason for leaving a cocktail party because we know people want to avoid, escape from, be safe from, put distance between themselves and what they fear. Jealousy is the motive in a poisoning because, among other things, the poisoner believes their action will harm their rival, remove the cause of their agony, or redress an injustice, and these are the sorts of things a jealous person wants to do. When we learn a person cheated their son out of greed, we do not necessarily know what the primary reason was, but we know there was one, and its general nature. Gilbert Ryle analyzes, He boasted from vanity, into, He boasted on meeting the stranger, and his doing so satisfies the law-like proposition that whenever he finds a chance, of securing the admiration and envy of others, he does whatever he thinks will produce this admiration and envy. This is from The Concept of Mind. This analysis is often, and perhaps justly, criticized on the ground that a person may boast from vanity just once. But if Ryle's boaster did what he did from vanity, then something entailed by Ryle's analysis is true. The boaster wanted to secure the admiration and envy of others, and he believed that his actions would produce this admiration and envy. True or false, Ryle's analysis does not dispense with primary reasons, but depends upon them. To know a primary reason why someone acted as they did is to know an intention with which the action was done. If I turn left at a fork because I want to get to Kathmandu, my intention in turning left is to get to Kathmandu. But to know the intention is not necessarily to know the primary reason in full detail. If James goes to church with the intention of pleasing his mother, then he must have some pro-attitude toward pleasing his mother. 
but it needs more information to tell whether his reason is that he enjoys pleasing his mother or thinks it right, his duty, or an obligation. The expression, the intention with which James went to church, has the outward form of a description, but in fact it is syncategorimatic and cannot be taken to refer to an entity, state, disposition, or event. Its function in context is to generate new descriptions of actions in terms of their reason. Thus, James went to church with the intention of pleasing his mother, yields a new and fuller description of the action described in James went to church. Essentially, the same process goes on when I answer the question, why are you bobbing around that way? With, I'm knitting, weaving, exercising, sculling, cuddling, training fleas. Straight description of an intended result often explains an action better than stating that the result was intended or desired. It will soothe your nerves, explains why I pour you a shot as efficiently as I want to do something to soothe your nerves. Since the first in the context of explanation implies the second, but the first does better because, if it is true, the facts will justify my choice of action. Because justifying and explaining an action so often go hand in hand, we frequently indicate the primary reason for an action by making a claim which, if true, would also verify, vindicate, or support the relevant belief or attitude of the agent. I knew I ought to return it. The paper said it was going to snow. You stepped on my toes. All, in appropriate reason-giving contexts, perform this familiar dual function. The justifying role of reason, given this interpretation, depends upon the explanatory role, but the converse does not hold. Your stepping on my toes neither explains nor justifies my stepping on your toes unless I believe you stepped on my toes, but the belief alone, true or false, explains my action. Section 3. In the light of a primary reason, an action is revealed as coherent with certain traits, long or short-termed, characteristic or not, of the agent, and the agent is shown in their role of rational animal. Corresponding to the belief and attitude of a primary reason for an action, we can always construct with a little ingenuity, the premises of a syllogism from which it follows that the action has some, as Miss Anscombe calls it, desirability characteristic. Thus, there is a certain irreducible, though somewhat anemic, sense in which every rationalization justifies. From the agent's point of view, there was, when they acted, something to be said for the action. Noting that non-teleological causal explanations do not display the element of justification provided by reasons, some philosophers have concluded that the concept of cause that applies elsewhere cannot apply to the relation between reasons and actions, and that the pattern of justification provides, in the case of reasons, the required explanation. But suppose we grant that reasons alone justify in explaining actions. It does not follow that the explanation is not also, and necessarily, causal. Indeed, our first condition for primary reason, condition one from earlier, is designed to help set rationalizations apart from other sorts of explanation. If rationalization is, as I want to argue, a species of causal explanation, then justification in the sense given by condition one is at least one differentiating property. How about the other claim, that justifying is a kind of explaining so that the ordinary notion of cause need not be brought in? Here it is necessary to decide what is being included under justification. Perhaps it means only what is given by condition one, that the agent has certain beliefs and attitudes in the light of which the action is reasonable. 
But then something essential has certainly been left out, for a person can have a reason for an action and perform the action, and yet this reason not be the reason why they did it. Central to the relation between a reason and an action it explains is the idea that the agent performed the action because they had the reason. Of course, we can include this idea too in justification, but then the notion of justification becomes as dark as the notion of reason until we can account for the force of that because. When we ask why someone acted as they did, we want to be provided with an interpretation. Their behavior seems strange, alien, pointless, out of character, disconnected, or perhaps we cannot even recognize an action in it. When we learn their reason, we have an interpretation, a new description of what they did, which fits it into a familiar picture. The picture certainly includes some of the Asians' beliefs and attitudes, perhaps also goals, ends, principles, general character traits, virtues or vices. Beyond this, the redescription of an action afforded by a reason may place the action in a wider social, economic, linguistic, or evaluative context. To learn, through learning the reason, that the agent conceived their action as a lie, a repayment of a debt, an insult, the fulfillment of an avuncular obligation, or a night's gambit, is to grasp the point of the action in its setting of rules, practices, conventions, and expectations. Remarks like these, inspired by the later Wittgenstein, have been elaborated with subtlety and insight by a number of philosophers. And there is no denying that this is true. When we explain an action by giving the reason, we do re-describe the action. Redescribing the action gives the action a place in a pattern, and in this way the action is explained. Here it is tempting to draw two conclusions that do not follow. First, we can't infer from the fact that giving reasons merely redescribes the action and that causes are separate from effects, that therefore reasons are not causes. Reasons, being beliefs and attitudes, are certainly not identical with actions. But, more important, events are often redescribed in terms of their causes. Suppose someone was burned. We could redescribe this event in terms of a cause by saying he was burned. Second, it is an error to think that because placing the action in a larger pattern explains it, Therefore, we now understand the sort of explanation involved. Talk of patterns and contexts does not answer the question of how reasons explain actions, since the relevant pattern or context contains both reason and action. One way we can explain an event is by placing it in the context of its cause. Cause and effect form the sort of pattern that explains the effect, in a sense of explain that we understand as well as any. If reason and action illustrate a different pattern of explanation, that pattern must be identified. Let me urge the point in connection with an example of Meldon's. A person driving an automobile raises their arm in order to signal. Their intention to signal explains their action raising their arm by redescribing it as signaling. What is the pattern that explains the action? Is it the familiar pattern of an action done for a reason? Then it does indeed explain the action, but only because it assumes the relation of reason and action that we want to analyze. Or is the pattern rather this? The person is driving. They are approaching a turn. They know they ought to signal. They know how to signal by raising their arm. And now, in this context, they raise their arm. Perhaps, as Meldon suggests, if all this happens, they do signal. And the explanation would then be this. If, under these conditions, a person raises their arm, then they signal. The difficulty is, of course, that this explanation does not touch the question of why they raised their arm. 
They had a reason to raise their arm, but this has not been shown to be the reason why they did it. If the description signaling explains their action by giving their reason, then the signaling must be intentional, but on the account just given, it may not be. If, as Meldon claims, causal explanations are wholly irrelevant to the understanding we seek of human actions, then we are without an analysis of the because in They Did It Because, where we go on to name a reason. Hampshire remarks of the relation between reasons and action, In philosophy, one ought surely to find this dot 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 connection altogether mysterious, end quote. Hampshire rejects Aristotle's attempt to solve the mystery by introducing the concept of wanting as a causal factor, on the grounds that the resulting theory is too clear and definite to fit all cases, and that, quote, there is still no compelling ground for insisting that the word want must enter into every full statement of reasons for acting, end quote. I agree that the concept of wanting is too narrow, but I have argued that, at least in a vast number of typical cases, some pro-attitude must be assumed to be present if a statement of an agent's reasons in acting is to be intelligible. Hampshire does not see how Aristotle's scheme can be appraised as true or false. Quote, for it is not clear what could be the basis of assessment or what kind of evidence could be decisive. End quote. Failing a satisfactory alternative, the best argument for a scheme like Aristotle's is that it alone promises to give an account of the mysterious connection between reasons and actions. That's the end of section three. Often in philosophy papers, the author will anticipate potential objections to their own view and respond to them. Davidson does this in the next and final section. Section 4. In order to turn the first and to because in the sentence, he exercised and he wanted to reduce and thought exercise would do it, we must, as the basic move, Augment condition 1 with condition 2. A primary reason for an action is its cause. The considerations in favor of condition 2 are by now, I hope, obvious. In the remainder of this paper, I wish to defend condition 2 against various lines of attack and, in the process, to clarify the notion of causal explanation involved. The first line of attack is this. Primary reasons consist of attitudes and beliefs, which are states or dispositions, not events. Therefore, they cannot be causes. It is easy to reply that states, dispositions, and conditions are frequently named as the causes of events. The bridge collapsed because of a structural defect. The plane crashed on takeoff because the air temperature was abnormally high. The plate broke because it had a crack. This reply does not, however, meet a closely related point. Mention of a causal connection for an event gives a cause only on the assumption that there was also a preceding event. But what is the preceding event that causes an action? In many cases, it is not difficult at all to find events very closely associated with the primary reason. States and dispositions are not events, but the onslaught of a state or disposition is. A desire to hurt your feelings may spring up at the moment you anger me. I may start wanting to eat a melon just when I see one, and beliefs may begin at the moment we notice, perceive, learn, or remember something. Those who have argued that there are no mental events to qualify as causes of actions have often missed the obvious because they have insisted that a mental event be observed or noticed, rather than an observing or a noticing, or that it be like a stab, a qualm, a prick, or a quiver, a mysterious prod of conscience or act of the will. Meldon, in discussing the driver who signals a turn by raising their arm, challenges those who want to explain actions causally to identify an event which is common and peculiar to all such cases. Perhaps a motive or an intention, anyway, some particular feeling or experience. 
But of course there is a mental event. At some moment the driver noticed, or thought they noticed, their turn coming up, and that is the moment they signaled. During any continuing activity, like driving or elaborate performance like swimming the Hellespont, there are more or less fixed purposes, standards, desires, and habits that give direction and form to the entire enterprise. And there is the continuing input of information about what we are doing, about changes in the environment, in terms of which we regulate and adjust our actions. To dignify a driver's awareness that their turn has come by calling it an experience, much less a feeling, is no doubt exaggerated. But whether it deserves a name or not, it had better be the reason why they raise their arm. In this case, and typically, there may not be anything we would call a motive. But if we mention such a general purpose as wanting to get to one's destination safely, it is clear that the motive is not an event. The intention with which the driver raises their arm is also not an event, for it is no thing at all, neither event, attitude, disposition, nor object. Finally, Meldon asks the causal theorist to find an event that is common and peculiar to all cases where a person intentionally raises their arm, and this, it must be omitted, cannot be produced. But then neither can a common and unique cause of bridge failures, plane crashes, or plate breakings be produced. The signaling driver can answer the question, why did you raise your arm when you did? And from the answer we learn the event that caused the action. But can an actor always answer such a question? Sometimes the answer will mention a mental event that does not give a reason. For example, finally, I made up my mind. However, there also seem to be cases of intentional action where we cannot explain at all why we acted when we did. In such cases, explanation in terms of primary reasons parallels the explanations of the collapse of the bridge from a structural defect. We are ignorant of the event or sequence of events that led up to or caused the collapse, but we are sure that there was such an event or sequence of events. The second line of attack. According to Meldon, a cause must be logically distinct from the alleged effect. But a reason for an action is not logically distinct from the action. Therefore, reasons are not causes of actions. One possible form of this argument has already been suggested. Since a reason makes an action intelligible by redescribing it, we do not have two events, but only one under different descriptions. Causal relations, however, demand distinct events. Someone might be tempted into the mistake of thinking that my flipping of the switch caused my turning on of the light. In fact, it caused the light to go on. But it does not follow that it is a mistake to take my reason for flipping the switch was that I wanted to turn on the light, as entailing in part, I flipped the switch and this action is further describable as having been caused by my wanting to turn on the light. To describe an event in terms of its cause is not to identify the event with its cause, nor does explanation by redescription exclude causal explanation. The example serves also to refute the claim that we cannot describe the action without using words that link it to the alleged cause. Here the action is to be explained under the description, my flipping the switch, and the alleged cause is my wanting to turn on the light. What possible logical relation is supposed to hold between these phrases? It seems more plausible to urge a logical link between my turning on the light and my wanting to turn on the light. But even here the link turned out earlier, on inspection, to be grammatical rather than logical. In any case, there is something very odd in the idea that causal relations are empirical rather than logical. What can this mean? Surely not that every true causal statement is empirical. For suppose A caused B is true, then the cause of B is A. So, substituting, we have the cause of B caused B, 
which is analytic. The truth of a causal statement depends on what events are described. Its status as analytic or synthetic depends on how the events are described. Still, it may be maintained that a reason rationalizes an action only when the descriptions are appropriately fixed and the appropriate descriptions are not logically independent. Suppose that to say a person wanted to turn on the light meant that they would perform any action they believed would accomplish this end. Then the statement of their primary reason for flipping the switch would entail that they flipped the switch. Straight away he acts, as Aristotle says. In this case, there would certainly be a logical connection between reason and action, the same sort of connection as that between it's water-soluble and was placed in water, and it dissolved. Since the implication runs from description of cause to description of effect, but not conversely, naming the cause still gives information. And, though the point is often overlooked, Placing it in water caused it to dissolve does not entail its water soluble. So the latter has an additional explanatory force. Nevertheless, the explanation would be far more interesting if, in place of solubility, with its obvious definitional connection with the event to be explained, we could refer to some property, say a particular crystalline structure, whose connection with dissolution in water was known only through experiment. Now it is clear why primary reasons, like desires and wants, do not explain actions in the relatively trivial way solubility explains dissolvings. Solubility, we are assuming, is a pure disposition property. It is defined in terms of a single test. But desires cannot be defined in terms of the actions they may rationalize, even though the relation between desire and action is not simply empirical. There are other, equally essential criteria for desires, their expression in feelings and in actions that they do not rationalize, for example. The person who has a desire, or want or belief, does not normally need criteria at all, they generally know, even in the absence of any clues available to others, what they want, desire, and believe. These logical features of primary reasons show that it is not just lack of ingenuity that keeps us from defining them as dispositions to act for these reasons. The Third Line of Attack According to Hume, quote, we may define a cause to be an object, followed by another, and where all the objects similar to the first are followed by objects similar to the second. But, Hart and Honoré claim, quote, The statement that one person did something because, for example, another threatened him, carries no implication or covert assertion that if the circumstances were repeated, the same action would follow. End quote. Hart and Honoré allow that Hume is right in saying that ordinary singular causal statements imply generalizations, but wrong for this very reason in supposing that motives and desires are ordinary causes of actions. In brief, laws are involved, essentially, in ordinary causal explanations, but not in rationalizations. It is common to try to meet this argument by suggesting that we do have rough laws connecting reasons and actions, and these can, in theory, be improved. True, threatened people do not always respond in the same way, but we may distinguish between threats and also between agents in terms of their beliefs and attitudes. The suggestion is delusive, however, because generalizations connecting reasons and actions are not, and cannot, be sharpened into the kind of law on the basis of which accurate predictions can reliably be made. If we reflect on the way in which reasons determine choice, decision, and behavior, it is easy to see why this is so. What emerges in the ex post facto atmosphere of explanation and justification as the reason frequently was, to the Asian at the time of action, one consideration among many, just a reason. 
Any serious theory for predicting action on the basis of reasons must find a way of evaluating the relative force of various desires and beliefs in the matrix of decision. It cannot take as its starting point the refinement of what is to be expected from a single desire. The practical syllogism exhausts its role in displaying an action as falling under one reason, so it cannot be subtilized into a reconstruction of practical reasoning, which involves the weighing of competing reasons. The practical syllogism provides a model neither for a predictive science of action nor for a normative account of evaluative reasoning. Ignorance of competent predictive laws does not inhibit valid causal explanation, or few causal explanations could be made. I am certain the window broke because it was struck by a rock. I saw it all happen. But I am not, in command of laws on the basis of which I can predict what blows will break which windows. A generalization like, windows are fragile, and fragile things tend to break when struck hard enough, other conditions being right, is not a predictive law in the rough. The predictive law, if we had it, would be quantitative and would use very different concepts. The generalization, like our generalizations about behavior, serves a different function. It provides evidence for the existence of a causal law covering the case at hand. We are usually far more certain of a singular causal connection than we are of any causal law governing the case. Does this show that Hume was wrong in claiming that singular causal statements entail laws? Not necessarily, for Hume's claim, as quoted above, is ambiguous. It may mean that A caused B entails some particular law involving the predicates used in the descriptions A and B, or it may mean that A caused B entails that there exists a causal law instantiated by some true descriptions of A and B. Obviously, both versions of Hume's doctrine give a sense to the claim that singular causal statements entail laws, and both sustain the view that causal explanations involve laws. But the second version is far weaker, in that no particular law is entailed by a singular causal claim, and a singular causal claim can be defended, if it needs defense, without defending any law. Only the second version of Hume's doctrine can be made to fit with most causal explanations. It suits rationalizations equally well. The most primitive explanation of an event gives its cause. More elaborate explanations may tell more of the story or defend the singular causal claim by producing a relevant law or by giving reasons for believing such exists. But it is an error to think no explanation has been given until a law has been produced. Linked with these errors is the idea that singular causal statements necessarily indicate, by the concepts they employ, the concepts that will occur in the entailed law. Suppose a hurricane, which is reported on page 5 of Tuesday's Times, causes a catastrophe which is reported on page 13 of Wednesday's Tribune. Then the event reported on page 5 of Tuesday's Times caused the event reported on page 13 of Wednesday's Tribune. Should we look for a law relating events of these kinds? It is only slightly less ridiculous to look for a law relating hurricanes and catastrophes. The laws needed to predict the catastrophe with precision would, of course, have no use for concepts like hurricane and catastrophe. The trouble with predicting the weather is that the descriptions under which events interest us, a cool cloudy day with rain in the afternoon, have only remote connections with the concepts employed by the more precise known laws. The laws whose existence is required if reasons are causes of actions do not, we may be sure, deal in the concepts in which rationalizations must deal. If the causes of a class of events, actions, fall in a certain class, reasons, and there is a law to back each singular causal statement, it does not follow that there is any law connecting events classified as reasons with events classified as actions. 
The classifications may even be neurological, chemical, or physical. The fourth line of attack. It is said that the kind of knowledge one has of one's own reasons in acting is not compatible with existence of a causal relation between reasons and actions, i.e., a person knows their own intentions in acting infallibly, without induction or observation, and no ordinary causal relation can be known in this way. No doubt our knowledge of our own intentions in acting will show many of the oddities peculiar to first-person knowledge of one's own pains, beliefs, desires, and so on. The only question is whether these oddities prove that reasons do not cause, in any ordinary sense at least, the actions that they rationalize. You may easily be wrong about the truth of a statement of the form, I am poisoning Charles because I want to save him pain. Because you may be wrong about whether you are poisoning Charles, sure, you may yourself be drinking the poisoned cup by mistake. But it also seems that you may err about your reasons, particularly when you have two reasons for an action, one of which pleases you and one of which does not. For example, you do want to save Charles Payne. You also want him out of the way. You may be wrong about which motive made you do it. The fact that you may be wrong does not show that in general it makes sense to ask you how you know what your reasons were or to ask for your evidence. Though you may, on rare occasions, accept public or private evidence as showing you are wrong about your reasons, you usually have no evidence and make no observations. Then your knowledge of your own reasons for your actions is not generally inductive, for where there is induction, there is evidence. Does this show the knowledge is not causal? I cannot see that it does. Causal laws differ from true but non-law-like generalizations in that their instances confirm them. Induction is, therefore, certainly a good way to learn the truth of a law. It does not follow that it is the only way to learn the truth of a law. In any case, in order to know that a singular causal statement is true, it is not necessary to know the truth of a law. It is necessary only to know that some law covering the events at hand exists. And it is far from evident that induction and induction alone yields the knowledge that a causal law satisfying certain conditions exists. Or, to put it differently, one case is often enough, as Hume admitted, to persuade us that a law exists, and this amounts to saying that we are persuaded, without direct inductive evidence, that a causal relation exists. The last line of attack and the final paragraph. Finally, I should like to say something about a certain uneasiness some philosophers feel in speaking of causes of actions at all. Meldon, for example, says that actions are often identical with bodily movements and that bodily movements have causes. Yet he denies that the causes are causes of the actions. This is, I think, a contradiction. He is led to it by the following sort of consideration. Quote, it is futile to attempt to explain conduct through the causal efficacy of desire. All that can explain is further happenings, not actions performed by agents. The agent confronting the causal nexus in which such happenings occur is a helpless victim of all that occurs in and to him. End quote. Unless I am mistaken, this argument, if it were valid, would show that actions cannot have causes at all. I shall not point out the obvious difficulties in removing actions from the realm of causality entirely, but perhaps it is worth trying to uncover the source of the trouble. Why on earth should a cause turn an action into a mere happening and a person into a helpless victim? Is it because we tend to assume, at least in the arena of action, that a cause demands a causer, agency an agent? So we press the question, if my action is caused, what caused it? If I did, then there is the absurdity of infinite regress. If I did not, I am a victim. But of course, the alternatives are not exhaustive. Some causes have no agents. 
Primary among these are those states and changes of state in persons which, because they are reasons as well as causes, make persons voluntary agents. I love this paper. I first read it as a third year university student in Professor Michael Smith's class. Michael Smith, who is the author of the well-cited book, The Moral Problem. I loved this paper then and I still love it today. As promised, here is a short bit on Donald Davidson. Donald Davidson, who lived from 1917 to 2003, is one of the most influential philosophers from the second half of the 20th century, especially from the 1960s onwards. He produced influential work in many different fields within philosophy, but I will save mention of his ideas outside of action theory for when I share his other papers. This particular paper, Actions, Reasons, and Causes, is, I believe, his most famous work, which, as a paper, not a book, but a paper, has over 4,000 citations, and which launched the field of action theory to a completely new direction from which it had been heading. His most important philosophical influences are said to have been Quine, who was his advisor, C.I. Lewis, Tarski, Kant, Alfred North Whitehead, Wittgenstein, Frege, Bertrand Russell, and thus also Kripke, Putnam, among others. You can also, of course, and this is why I chose Actions, Reasons, and Causes as the first video here on Aristotle Walks, clearly see Aristotle's influence on his ideas. Davidson has, in turn, influenced many philosophers after him, including, but not limited to, John McDowell, Richard Rorty, Colin McGinn, but really anyone working in the theory of action in the last 50 years has had to have read Davidson. Davidson was born in Springfield, Massachusetts, and he lived in the Philippines until he was four, when his family moved back to the U.S. He attended Harvard, from which he graduated in 1939, he worked a bit with music, he was friends with Bernstein, and had a bit of a successful career in writing radio scripts in Cali. He taught as a professor of philosophy at many schools, including Stanford, Rockefeller University, Princeton, U Chicago, and from 1981 until his death, he taught at Berkeley. What I find particularly wonderful about Donald Davidson is that though he was schooled in the analytic tradition, his wide-ranging philosophical approach was such that the reception of his work was not limited to analytic philosophers, but also extended to continental philosophers. All in all, he was a big deal. This paper, Actions, Reasons, and Causes, as you heard, argues that an agent giving their reason for an action, this process which Davidson terms rationalizing an action, is one of giving a causal explanation for the action. His theory places the person who engages in an action as an agent, as a cause of their own movements, as possessing an intention to move in a particular way. He says that this primary reason for an action consists in the combination of two things, one, a pro-attitude for something, and two, a belief that doing the action in question will bring about that something toward which they have their pro-attitude. In asking someone for the reason why they did what they did, we want their answer to inform us of for which reason they did what they did. Davidson's framework allows for this. The primary reason, the mental occurrence the person cites, rationalizes their action. This conception of the relation between an action and its reason is obviously inspired by Aristotle's theory of action. I say obvious not only because of the clear conceptual resemblance, but also Davidson mentions Aristotle. I don't know how many times in this paper, I actually didn't count it, but I think at least five times, if not explicitly by name, which he does a few times, his appeal to the practical syllogism, he mentions in section 3 the agent as rational animal, which everyone, of course, knows Aristotle defined human beings as. Anyway, I want to point you toward the relevant text I think everyone should read in Aristotle. Please see chapters 1 through 5 of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, book 3. 
There you will find the most systematic treatment of how a person produces a voluntary action, as well as the oddity that Davidson mentioned in section 4, where a person, upon making a decision, a prohiresis, immediately acts. In the future, I will also be reading aloud papers written on these chapters in Aristotle, so you could also wait for those videos. If you made it this far into this video, thank you so much. I hope that you enjoyed Davidson's amazing paper. The goal, the end, the telos of this channel, Aristotle Walks, is to make philosophy, in particular ancient, but also contempt, more accessible. In creating this channel, I am thinking about serious students of philosophy who are auditory learners. I am thinking about people who are interested in philosophy but reading very dense philosophy papers is a bit too much. I hope that listening to them is something one can approach. I'm thinking about students considering the study of philosophy or in the beginnings of their journey who do not know to which papers they should turn. Here, I will highlight the best papers, the most influential papers, the ones you should probably read first. To do this, I am getting guidance from my mentors, who are some of the leading scholars in the field of philosophy today. Finally, and most importantly, I am thinking about students with vision impairments. I think that it is a huge problem that many fields of work, including, but actually particularly, academia, is so inaccessible for students with disabilities. I hope to build this channel, Aristotle Walks, into a helpful resource for a variety of learners. This YouTube channel, Aristotle Walks, is a counterpart an antistrophos to my Instagram account, Aristotle Walks, where I post ideas from the Corpus Aristotelicum daily. I would appreciate it if you followed it. Thank you, and I hope you have a lovely day.